Hello everyone, it is good to be with you again as we continue walking through the book of Ruth. This week we get to kind of, I don't know, maybe the climax of the story or at least the part that kind of sticks out to our minds the most as we get to Ruth chapter 3, really to Ruth's proposal of marriage to Boaz. And this is a really interesting chapter. There's a lot going on here that maybe we don't catch at first glance, um, but it's relatively short, so hopefully we should be able to have our study be a little bit shorter this week, too. I suppose we do have a pastor leading it, so the, uh, the possibility that I go a little longer than I thought I would is certainly out there. Um, but we're going to start with Ruth chapter 3, verse 1, and really this entire section is, titled, is entitled, at least in my Bible, Ruth and Boaz at the Threshing Floor. And really that threshing floor is where we're going to see the majority, or at least the important portion of this story taking place. Uh, but we're going to start with chapter 3, verse 1. Just a reminder, Ruth has been gleaning in the fields of Boaz for the last couple of months during the harvest. And so what she's been doing is she's been following after the young women, and she's been picking up any of the leftovers, um, so that way she can take them home to Naomi. And Boaz has really been blessing her through this. He's actually even been being more generous than was required of him by the law um, to support her in her widowhood, to support her in her poverty, in this time of her life where she really has no one looking out for her or for her mother-in-law, Naomi. But that's about to change as we look at chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to Ruth, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. And so as we start out with this, these first couple of verses of the chapter, again, just this beautiful relationship between Naomi and between Ruth. I find it so beautiful that Naomi calls Ruth her daughter. And now I think a lot of us have that kind of relationship with our in-laws where we either call them mom or dad or they call us their son or their daughter. And yet here in Scripture, we see it just so firmly that this is the relationship that Naomi sees her daughter-in-law and doesn't see her as an in-law, but sees her as another part of her family, as her daughter. And she says, should I not seek rest for you? And really, this is just a reminder that right now, Ruth is having to actually do a fair amount of hard labor. She's having to go out into the fields every day and continue to walk behind the harvesters and to just pick up as much of the scraps as she can. And if you'll recall, we found out that at least that very first time that she went gleaning, she ended up carrying 29 pounds of barley back to her home. That is a fair amount of weight to be carrying. That would be like carrying around my oldest daughter literally all day, or gradually adding, I suppose, up to that weight. But that's an impressive amount of work that's being done there. Um, and as we think about this culture, we think about how Ruth's work was meant to be in the home. And so Naomi is saying, I want to find rest for you. I want you to not have to be working in this manner. I want to give you security and peace. And so she points out again, hey, you've been in the field of this Boaz guy. And remember, he's one of our kinsmen. He's one of our redeemers, someone who could maybe save us from this situation that we are in. And tonight, He's going to be at the threshing floor. So verse 3, Wash therefore and anoint yourself and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. I think it's interesting. I read this in a commentary as I was prepping for this study, and I'd never thought about it this way. We see Naomi telling Ruth basically that she's supposed to put on her Sunday best. Um, as we think about the Hebrew here, we're seeing something, we're not entirely sure what it means, but we're seeing something along the lines of this is going to be your best clothing. You're really going to put on your best clothes. You're going to anoint yourself. You're going to put on your perfume and put on your cloak and go down to the threshing floor. What this commentator found so interesting is that obviously perfume, ointment, is a very valuable resource, especially at this time. And if she has a clothing that would be considered her best dress, these women 
came from means. Maybe we even see that with their kinsman Boaz being so wealthy. Naomi and Ruth had been comfortably provided for throughout their lives. But now they have fallen on these hard times, and maybe it makes us sympathize with them even more. As we think about, these were women who, it sounds like, at least from this, who had had wealth and now had nothing. Um, And so maybe we can just see what they're going through and appreciate a little bit further just how severely these deaths have impacted them. Um, Where instead of being dressed up, instead of having their ointment, um, instead Ruth is out every day doing manual labor to try to survive. We certainly see just kind of the fall in station that has happened here with Ruth and Naomi. But, verse 4, when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And Ruth replied, all that you say, I will do. So we see this obedience from Ruth here as she is talking to her mother, mother mother-in-law. Now, what you see here on the screen is an image of what a threshing floor might have looked like. Um, It basically would have been a large circular area that you would have used to kind of crush the wheat or the barley. Um, And so what would happen, sometimes you would use an animal, sometimes you would use a special tool that you would basically just beat the wheat or the barley as it was down on the threshing floor. And then what you would do is you would sweep away kind of the part, the stalk, the part of the barley that wasn't edible, and you'd have the rest of it. Now, the rest of it would still have what is called the chaff. Um, This is when Jesus talks about the wheat and the chaff. This is what he's talking about uh, with winnowing forks in their hand. He's talking about this practice where after you've cleared out the other part of the wheat or barley that is inedible, you would have this part left that still had one kind of inedible sleeve is my understanding. I could be wrong on this. Again, I was doing some research on it. I'm not much of a farmer myself. Uh, But what you would do then is the reason why it's so open is that you needed wind because what you would do is you would either use a winnowing fork and you would toss it up in the air or you would do this by hand. You could potentially just kind of be throwing up the wheat into the air uh, within this circle still. And what would happen is the chaff, that part of the wheat that you could not eat, would get blown away. And so you would see these areas in open, you would see threshing floors in the ancient world in kind of open, breezy areas because you needed that wind to be able to blow the chaff away from the wheat so that you could have the good stuff, so that you could have what is edible. Um, And so when we're picturing this scene, this threshing floor, I do think it's interesting. I've always had this image of it with a stable, and I even have an image that's kind of like that here. There's not necessarily reason to think that this is a covered area. It's probably pretty open. And so Naomi is telling Ruth, hey, go down to this area and watch and see where Boaz lies down. Uh, Because typically, or at least it sounds like from our understanding, the practice was the workers who were threshing, who were winnowing, would stay there over the night. So that way they could protect their crop. Um, So that way people couldn't come and grab it and steal it. So you'd have the workers there. And we see (laughs) Naomi specifically reminding Ruth, Make sure you see where he lays down. Because if you go lay down at the feet of the wrong guy, this is going to be a really awkward, uncomfortable situation. Speaking of feet, um, there's a little bit of controversy about what actually is taking place here. In verse three, verse sorry, in chapter three, verse four, we read that Naomi says that she Ruth is to uncover Boaz's feet. And the Hebrew word used there, I have up on the screen for you, uh, regal. And regal, most literally translated, is simply feet. However, it can sometimes be used as a euphemism for another part of the male anatomy. And so some commentators have suggested that what's actually happening here. Um, is a little more, let's call it immoral, Um, that Ruth is going down there with the intention of seducing 
Boaz, of drawing him into marriage in that fashion. And people will look and they'll say, well, look, see, she dolls herself up. She gets her best clothes on. She gets her perfume on. She waits until the darkness of night. Um, in a couple of minutes, we'll see that he has her leave before morning, um, before the sun is up so that she can be seen. And so there's this image that perhaps there's more going on here than just that she's laying down at his feet. And again, grammatically, that's possible. This word ragal can certainly be used in that way. But as we think about the scriptures as a whole, um, very rarely is that act, um, that sexual act, depicted in such a hidden fashion within the scriptures. Uh, we tend to know pretty clearly what's going on. So the fact that they would be kind of hidden probably sways me against that understanding. Also, as we think about these two characters, we're meant to see them as very noble, as following the rules, kind of the letter of the law we'll see with Boaz later in chapter 4, and really at the end of chapter 3. And I think there's perfectly good explanations for this um, that would see this as simply she lays herself at his feet. And we'll talk about that as we continue on with the story. Verse 6, so she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. Again, we have this word drawn from that ragal used there um, for feet. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over and behold, a woman lay at his feet. This would be another potential reason why I think we are supposed to just see it as feet, as we see depicted here in this um, painting, drawing of the account. We have Boaz lay down after he's eaten, after he's had his drink, and Ruth, as soon as it's dark, it sounds like, or as soon as he's laid himself down, comes over and lays down quietly at his feet. She uncovers his feet and lays there. The next verse says specifically at midnight, and that's what it starts with, um, really just kind of in the dead of night is the Hebrew word being used there. Um, but we're meant to see, I think, a passing of time, which if we were saying that she uncovered another part of him, I think that passing of time would not be so duly noted, um, that we would see perhaps a more immediate reaction. So I think the author here is even trying to clue us in, no, 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 don't take this the wrong way. Although maybe there is kind of a double entendre that he's trying to give or deliver for us. Um, something that the early Israelites might have seen as a little humorous as they were reading this story. Um, but I think he's trying to say, no, 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 look, their time passes. She does just uncover his feet. And eventually at around midnight, at the coolest part of the night, he realizes his feet are uncovered, wakes up, and suddenly realizes there is a woman at his feet. Now, why at his feet? Um, some of this could have to do with the kinsman-redeemer laws. Um, we talked about this last week in Deuteronomy chapter 25, the punishment for not taking on someone in leveret marriage um, was that your sandal would be removed. As we see later in chapter 4, that sandal is going to feature prominently again. There's this image of feet, for whatever reason, associated with the kinsman redeemer. I think another reason, um, one that maybe goes into kind of what St. Paul talks about as he talks about marriage, about husbands and wives and their roles um, within his ordering of creation, is that Ruth is submitting herself to Boaz. By laying down at his feet, she is saying, I am willing to submit to you as your wife. And certainly we would understand then why she is so dressed up, why she is perfumed. This is her marriage proposal. This is Ruth saying to Boaz, Boaz, and we'll see this in just a little bit, cover me with your cloak, protect me, take me into your family, and I will submit to you as my authority. I will submit to you as my husband, as the one who is going to care for me. 
And I think that is probably more indicative of what's happening here with the feet. Um, as we talk about the covering, we're going to see it right here. Verse chapter 9, Boaz said, Who are you? And Ruth answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Um, it's interesting. She uses the same wording that Boaz kind of used in chapter 2 as he was talking about how the Lord was taking Ruth and Naomi under his wings, under his kanaf. And she uses that same imagery here. And I think it actually has to do with that outer garment, that cloak that she's just uncovered his feet with. She's uncovering his feet so that he can take his cloak and cover her. That kanaf can also certainly be seen, and in fact it is seen in the book of Ezekiel, as indicative of marriage, as the means by which a man would say, look, this is my wife. This is the one who I am going to guard, who is going to be under my protection, who's going to be under my care, who I am going to love even to the point of death. Who I am going to serve, and who in turn is going to serve me. So I think we see here this actual rich imagery um, of this marriage proposal that is taking place at his literal feet, that he is going to redeem Ruth, or at least that's the request that Ruth is making, and that he is going to cover her with his garment, with his cloak, with his kanaf. Verse 10, and he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. Again, I think we see here the author very clearly saying, do not take this as a seduction taking place. Even Boaz right here is saying, you are a worthy woman, an honorable woman. Um, really what we see here, what we see Ruth doing here, potentially, and this wouldn't have been the case with Boaz, this would have been the case with the first kinsman redeemer who we'll meet in chapter four. Ruth has the right, well, more specifically, Naomi has the right to claim someone as a kinsman redeemer for her family. And the fact that it's not happening could bring public shame upon the kinsmen's redeemers who are not fulfilling their role. And so really what Ruth is doing here is coming to Boaz privately and giving him the opportunity to privately pass on his responsibility. To say, you know what? I've cared for you enough as it is. I'm not going to continue to care for you in this way. Um, so I think we see Ruth here following kind of by the book. And I know it sounds strange to us. This isn't how any of our marriage proposals went, at least as far as I know. Um, but I think we do see that Boaz is saying, hey, you're doing the right thing. You are asking your kinsman redeemer. You're not going after young men, whether rich or poor. That's not what's important to you. What's important to you is going by the book, coming to your kinsman redeemer and asking for his aid. Verse 13, remain tonight and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good. Sorry, I skipped verse 12. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good. You'll be taken care of. Let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. Certainly here we see Boaz say, yes, Ruth, I will marry you, but there's some legal steps that have to be taken place first. And so again, I think we see the author clearly saying, don't take it this way. Look at how these two people act. Boaz is acting honorably. He's saying, I want to marry you, Ruth. And in fact, we've seen from the start from Ruth chapter 2, even before he knew who she was, he was drawn to this woman. Um, I want to marry you, but there is a redeemer who's closer than I, and I have to let him make the decision first. So, when I think he says remain tonight, I think what he's saying is, look, it's not safe for you to be out on the roads in the middle of the night. Stay here. Again, we already see this protective covering coming into place. His wings, his kanaf being spread over her. I will care for you. You'll be protected. And then in the morning, I will go take care of the legal aspects of this. And so I think we see that Boaz would not risk 
um, the immorality that might be associated with this moment by taking upon himself what rightfully belongs to another. I think he's already clearly saying this in verse 13. And he is saying if he does not take you, if he does not redeem you, I'm going to do so. I will marry you. I will be your husband. Verse 14, so she lay at his feet until the morning, but arose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. Again, we actually do see here another reason why this would be very dangerous for her to do. Um, the threshing floor, like I said, is where all the workers are gathered, where they're all sleeping. So it's not like this is taking place in an isolated fashion. Boaz's hired hands are probably sleeping nearby. And so I think we see him even making this statement here to protect both of their honor, to say to those who might be there, who might know who Ruth is, nothing happened, and we're not going to talk about it because we don't want the wrong idea, the wrong impression to be given to the community around us. Ruth is upright, and so am I. And he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city, and when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did you fare, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, These six measures of barley he gave to me, for he said to me, You must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, Wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out, for the man will not rest, but will settle the matter today. And so we see Boaz is going to go forth and he's going to try to take care of this situation. He's going to go through the legal loopholes or the legal actions, I should say, and he's going to see if Ruth is going to be redeemed by him, if this offer of marriage that Ruth made is going to be greeted by his acceptance. Um, he's already verbally agreed to it in the event that the other redeemer does not do his responsibility, passes it on to Boaz. Um, but we see really one of the more interesting marriage proposals, I think, that we'll come across. And through it, we're going to see how God is going to continue to care for Ruth and Naomi. And frankly, how God is going to continue his salvific work. Remember, all of this is leading to who Boaz and Ruth give birth to. Um, Obed, then Jesse, then David, all the way down to Jesus. And so we see this as kind of that entry point into the salvation story here in Ruth. Uh, would you please join me in prayer before we close out? Lord God Almighty, we thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who has died and risen again, that we might have everlasting life and forgiveness of sins. Lord, as we come together and look at your story of salvation, it's always so interesting to see the faithfulness as well as the sin of your people. We're reminded of our own failures, but also of the ability that you have given to us to be faithful to your word, to follow where you lead. Lord, we thank you for the faithful examples of Ruth and Boaz who came together in love um, and through whom you have blessed all the nations in your son. Lord, we just pray that you would be with this world at this moment, that you would place your healing hand upon it, that where there is sickness, you would bring healing, where there is death, you would bring life. Lord, we just ask above all that you would help us too to be faithful examples of what the Christian life looks like, that all might come to know the saving love of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for your attention today. I hope that you are all doing well, and I will see you again soon.